Hello and welcome to this session um, at the Open Air and Data Forum at the Open Source Summit Latin America. Today we're going to talk about how we can train um, AI to understand code using the largest code data set called CodeNet. Um, myself, my name is Christian Cadman. I'm a software developer at IBM and I've been focusing on open source projects around machine learning and the machine learning ecosystem for the last couple of years. My co-presenter is Tommy Lee today, and he'll introduce himself. Hi, my name is Tommy. I'm a senior software developer at IBM focusing on open source. And my main focus is on the AI life cycles um, and contributing mainly on the Qflow projects. Awesome. And we both work at the IBM Center for Open Source Data and AI. And we're a group of data scientists and open source developers um, working from the San Francisco Bay Area but we have team members around the world. Um, the team here um, in California, we work at the IBM Silicon Valley Laboratories, and that's an aerial shot of our facilities. Um, it's nestled in, in the hills of Southern San Jose, and we have nothing but nature around. It's a great place to work. Okay, let's jump right in. Today, we're gonna talk about AI for Code. And AI for Code um, really concerns itself with teaching machines the language of machines. So it's a fairly new field in computer science and it uses technologies um, like natural language processing and document understanding coupled with code analysis and compilation techniques. Um, and the goal of the field is um, to enable, you know, the automation of the software engineering process, you know, help developers um, write code faster to um, so increase their productivity. Um, and then perform a myriad of tasks um, in an automated fashion that normally takes a lot of time, um, like code search, um, you know, do code completion, code to code translation. Um, and in the bigger, bigger picture, um, the goal here is, is to really analyze and modernize um, legacy software systems and migrate, you know, monolithic applications into modern microservices ready for the enterprise. Now, Everything in machine learning is, is based on data. Um, of course, you need compute power um, and algorithms, but without data, it, you can't really train machine learning models. And so in the recent past, we've seen that with ImageNet around, you know, around a decade ago now, um, there has been a huge um, advance in image recognition. Right, ImageNet, the data set, as you might be familiar with, has I think more than 14, mil, 40, 14 million images, um, you know, ranging 22,000 classes. And everything, everything from spiders to cars to pictures of nature is in there. And it really, you know, fueled uh, machine learning rev revolution. And so this all resulted in, you know, machines being near human, human you know, even exceeding human level um, expertise and and speed at some certain very narrow level tasks. Um, so the, the classification error for images really um, was reduced drastically. Um, so it's in such a way that um, machines can do a better job than humans. Um, and you might remember in 2011, um, IBM Watson competed at Jeopardy and beat the all-time reigning champ. Right, that was a huge advance in natural language understanding. Um, all because there was millions of, of megabytes, gigabytes of data available that uh, Watson could work through, right? And, and that really powered the language understanding algorithms in Watson. And then more recently, uh, in 2019, um, the project debater really showcased that, you know, machine learning models um, can produce can can really be engaged in conversations, can make arguments nowadays, and, you know, really almost pass the Turing task, which is when, if you don't know, if you're talking to a human or machine, um, you might be fooled to believe that you're debating an actual human. Now, we've seen that power of AI um, applied to human language, um, and there are tools available that you can have on your smartphone today. You can travel to Italy without being able to speak a single word of Italian, and you can use your phone and get real-time translations, right? And so really AI has been, been instrumental. Machine learning has really opened up um, the language of humans to machines. Um, now, what we need for, for understanding code um, 
and really AI for code is, is we need, you know, to apply, you know, similar concepts that, that were applied for natural language processing um, to the language of machines. And really, if you think about the language of machines, it's not very different than the language of humans, right? So um, in human language, you have, you know, German, French, um, Italian. From computers, you might have languages like Java, Python, COBOL, C. Um, and human language has structure, um, has grammar, has a vocabulary, um, syntax, all of which apply to machine, machine language as well. So really what we need um, to enable AI for code is, is a similar breakthrough that we've seen for ImageNet or for natural language processing. And ideally, um, what, what AI for code can do is really facilitate um, code translation, right? It will make search for code much easier. Um, you could use natural language to search for code, um, find code similarities, um, and, you know, if things work out well, um, your code should be much, much better in terms of performance and memory footprint. Um, and of course, code needs to be classified. What does that code do? Um, so all of these um, are use cases or applications for machine learning algorithms and AI that understands code. Now, what we also need is data. So in order to enable AI for code, we need a lot of code um, to look at. And that's where Project CodeNet comes in. Project CodeNet um, was contributed by IBM Research to the open source about a year ago. And it's a high quality code data set um, that's aimed to facilitate innovation and benchmarking in the field of AI for code. And so the data is, is just staggering, right? So there's 14 million um, code samples in the data set, um, spanning about 4,000 coding problems, and 55 programming languages, totaling more than half a billion lines of code. And the problems are really a diverse set of uh, coding problems. And all of the codes code here is has been belt tested. And there are tests provided for each of those um, code samples. Um, here you can see um, a polyglot of the languages in CodeNet. Um, as said, about 55 Different languages are represented in CodeNet. Um, the majority, however, is C, C++, and C Sharp, Python, and Java. And that's explained by the origin of that um, data set, right? So really, CodeNet, um, was, the CodeNet data set was curated from two sources, the AIZU online judge and the AdCoder um, coding judge websites. And there's a total of 4,000 problems that were posed to software developers who could then submit their solutions to those problems. Um, there were about um, 14 million submissions and more than half of them were accepted, meaning they could be compiled, they were executable, and they produced the results that were specified in the problem. About 30% were wrong answers, um, but that's not bad for this um, coordinate data set because you wanna be able to distinguish right from wrong. And another, about 17% were rejected for other causes. Um, the data itself um, is split into metadata and the actual source files, right? So each um, submission is a complete program um, in its own file. And there are, each, each of those files solves one of those problems, but many of those problems are solved in slightly different ways and in many different languages. Now, here's a quick look at what the metadata looks like at the data set level. Um, you can see, you know, every, every submission has an ID, a name, um, or every problem that's been posed, right, has a limit uh, on memory and time that it, it can consume, and a complexity. And then at the actual problem level, every submission has an ID as well. It can be mapped to the original problem, the user who submitted it, um, what language it's written in, um, when it was submitted, um, and what the status of the submission was. Was it, you know, a correct solution in a sense that was it compilable and executable and did it produce the results that, that were expected? And interestingly here is also that every solution um, also has a CPU time and the memory that's been used um, to run that piece of code. Okay, here's a quick look at the overall um, 
spread uh, in terms of the accepted versus rejected solutions and the error code or the abbreviations that are used in the data set, data set itself, if you want to play with the data set. All right, um, project code net, um, of course, is, is the data and the metadata, but it also comes with a set of tools. And those tools um, help to help to derive um, certain statistics from the data, um, help to access the data in the first place, you know, aggregate certain data in, uh, in certain ways and convert between different formats and allow to pre-process those files. Um, there's AST generation, uh, the, 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 the source code can be tokenized and, um, you know, data flow graphs can be generated from it. In the project code net um, GitHub repo, you can also find um, um, some experiments on the models. Um, you find graph neural network experiments. You can find the masked language model uh, and token-based similarity classification examples. There are also notebooks that can be run as is. Um, so you don't need more than Conda or your Python virtual environment. And you should be able to run um, the two notebooks that are in that repository. One um, is that mask language model. Um, and the other one is for language classification, uh, both of which we'll see in more detail a little later. Now, what are some real world um, applications? Um, so the idea of um, Project CodeNet is, is not to provide all solutions, but to provide a, a data set that can be used as a benchmark. Um, and for, for, you know, for machine learning models in the AI for code field. And so, of course, you know, one use case that we're going to see in more detail is code classification. Um, um, code similarity search can be useful. Um, source to source code translation, which is especially useful when, when you think of um, the gargantuan task of having to modernize um, existing legacy software systems, um, often written in, in languages that are no longer taught in schools, um, like they're are about 220 billion lines of COBOL code used in finance applications. Um, and most of the developers have long left, uh, you know, left their companies or even retired entirely. Um, and so it's, it's a big task to even understand what these monolithic software systems do, yet alone translate those systems um, into modern microservice architectures. And, you know, more to my heart is, um, you know, what, what really, it could really help developers um, write better code, right? So much of the time that developers spend is, is learning about code, reading through code, um, finding, you know, finding code on, in the inter on the internet, um, looking at Stack Overflow and other um, websites. So all of that, you know, ideally could be automated and then really make developers more productive. Um, and there are some existing applications already. Um, so. IBM's AI for Code Stack makes use of um, Project CodeNet. And you might have heard of DeepMind AlphaCode, and they used several data sets for their training, but CodeNet was one of their major sources. Um, and impressively, um, you know, AlphaCode really can compete with human programmers, you know, with most average code programmers and, you know, achieves a 50 to 60% accuracy, which is really mind boggling. With that, I want to hand over to Tommy to talk about the machine learning change that we're going to use to showcase some of um, Project CodeNet's um, examples today. Yeah, um, thanks, Christian. Um, uh, let me share my screen. So, as you know, Christian have introduced like the um, powerful and use cases uh, of how CodeNet dataset could be. Um, now I'm going to introduce the project, uh, the machine learning exchange on how we can actually share, you know, like some of the code net data set asset and how we got to use them and leverage them in, um, uh, an open source project that could, you know, train them, use them and, you know, apply them in real world use cases. So, um, just some background on what, um, machine learning exchange is, it's a, you know, a catalogs, um, platform that, you know, um, store the data and AI assets. And the goal for this platform is to actually exchange those data and AI assets so all developers could able to like develop data um, and AI that they have and share with you know other organization and also within open source um, community as well. And behind the scenes, um, 
you know, the machine learning exchange is mainly, you know, focused on uploading, registering, executing, and deploying uh, pipelines, models, data sets, and notebooks. Um, and the backend of the machine learning exchange is mostly powered by, you know, Google pipelines on Tacton to execute, you know, workflows um, based on, you know, the pipelines or how you want to handle the assets or how you could execute notebooks. Um, and furthermore, uh, you have, let's say, a models being trained as part of the workflow. You can also serve them using a serving engine called KSERV um, that is used to be a capable project and now get graduated to LFAI organization as well. And all the data management right, um, for handling, you know, data sets and how you could use those data sets is by DataStream. Um, it's a data sets management platforms. And last and not least, um, this, you know, like um, data set and model mostly coming from um, our code teams, uh, Dax and Max um, um, platform, which is stand for um, data asset exchange and model asset exchange. Um, and with all these assets, right, um, we actually standardize those asset metadata um, using an ML specs, um, which is actually uh, created by I think uh, one of the Microsoft projects, um, where it standardizes how you know ML metadata should be stored. And with this, we just want to go over a little bit of background on each of the integration and how you know data sets, your know, pipelines, and model is being used within machine learning exchange. So first we want to go over like how data set is being used in machine learning exchange. So when you have a very big data set, right, let's say you serve on the cloud, serve any blob storage, when you want to you know, leverage them inside, you know, your Kubernetes platform, you probably want to you know, have a way to download them. So data ship is a very good platform that able to, you know, leverage like any you know, blob um, data set you store either in S3 or NFS or H3. Um, any of those, you know, file system could able to just port them into a, you know, what we call a CSI plugin, right? That's live under the data stream operators. And the data stream operator basically just data, take those files, uh, create a connections and able to mount them as a volume for your Kubernetes part. So your Kubernetes part able to just they take that block storage without even knowing what underneath the storage is used because all those combination is handled by the data stream platforms. And next, once you have, let's say, you have your models is being trained um, uh, on top of those data sets, then you want to serve those models right, on top of like um, a platform that's running on Kubernetes. So one of those platforms we use is called KSERV, which, you know, is on, built on top of uh, Kubernetes and leverage, you know, it's still a okay to do um, traffic routing. So you can actually not only serve models, but you can also do A-B testing explain what your model is going to do and also log any information from the models into a uh, backend storage for further uh, analysis. And last but not least, to leverage all these, you know, like um, components into one workflows, we have introduced, you know, a uh, pipeline where um, it actually, you know, leverage how you, you know, take the data from your know, persistent volume, train them, serve them on the case of all those for a actually operate and run on top of Kubernetes pipeline. And we mainly are leveraging, you know, Kubernetes pipeline on top of TechTown because we also, you know, run Kubernetes pipeline on top of OpenShift and OpenShift is, um, you know, certified to run, you know, TechTown pipeline very securely. And of course, I, um, the Kubernetes pipelines are on top of TechTown is an open source version uh, on how you could run things on machine learning exchange, but we also have, you know, um, the same capabilities that um, run on top of our product called What's a Studio Pipeline. It basically just powered by, you know, the same technology that the um, Kubernetes Pipeline on top of TechTown, but with a more, you know, easy drag and drop UI, so you could easily build your ideal workflow using What's a Studio Pipelines and run on top of IBM Cloud. And with all these tools, right, all these tools that leverage together um, on top of machine and exchange, we are able to speed up the AI life cycles. So um, all these tools, you know, help us, you know, uh, process all the workflow faster among all the all those teams and all the any duplication asset, let's say model pipelines, data set could be shared across teams. So if a team has been developing a data set, they don't have to. Um, 
um, you know, we do it and they could just share with other teams. And when other team needs the same data set or when they develop, let's say, a pipeline or a certain workflow for that data set, um, the, the, the original creator of that uh, data set could also benefit and understand what are the use cases um, those data sets has been used for. Um, and also, it also handles some of the challenges, let's say, um, let's say release tracking, you know, metadata collections, uh, and traceability aspect of like, all these assets. Machine learning exchange also have the capabilities built for you to, uh, whatever you upload asset, it has a set of metadata saying uh, what this data set is certified for under whatever uh, license, let's say uh, Apache license, so you could actually use them without any risk. Um, and with all these, you know, capabilities and all these, you know, governance that we have built on top of these platforms, you, you will feel safe to use any, you know, asset, any data set that has been, you know, deployed and hosted by machine learning exchange. Um, and of course, last and not least, um, you know, with, with all these kind of like tools we have, how this actually been used, right, as a whole flows. So, um, as we know, when the data scientists need to like, develop a models, Usually they have to gather data, right? Um, and then once they have data, they still have to analyze them. Um, would they analyze and process the data, then they will put into a process of training them either into just traditional machine learning models or deep learning models. And, you know, evaluating them based on the feedbacks. And once it's ready for production, it has to deploy the model on the cloud and have some, you know, ways to maintain them. And all these kind of uh, steps could actually break down into, um, a lot of small steps and each of those small steps could, you know, take a whole team to do it. Let's say, you know, data preparation from, okay, even you have the data, right, um, hosting on some, somewhere uh, in the organization, you still have a whole team. You need to be clean those data, ingest them, analyze them, trans transform them, validate them, and spread those data into small chunks. And once you have those, you know, they um, process the data, um, then you will build a, a model, right, on top of those data optimize them, validate them, and see can you actually uh, also trade, trade them on scale to make, you know, a very robust models. Um, and this whole, you know, training step could take multiple iterations. And even once you have the whole model is being ready to deploy, deploy on cloud and on edge takes different kind of um, operations. And when you serve the model, how you, it takes like incoming data, right? For that model is also challenging and with all this information, monitoring them and fine tune them, improve them over time, takes multiple iterations of this whole you know, pipeline. So able to reuse them and run them right, as needed is very powerful, right? Um, to have this on top of machine learning exchange platforms. So with all this, you know, the advantage, um, now we introduce some of the you know main capabilities on um machine learning exchange, what you could do on top of them and how you could leverage them on your, you know, AI life cycles. So on machine learning exchange, you could, you know, as a user, anyone could just view, download, and if you log in as a, you know, a verified user, you could actually execute those pipelines as well. So once you, you know, find a workflow uh, that you like and you have data provided, you could just pick a pipeline, run them and see Let's say in this case, you could actually train the trusted AI pipelines by training the models and verify is this model is um, robust enough to serve on a production or is it fair enough, you know, um, to serve without any uh, governance issues. And then next, um, as you, you know, building pipelines, you probably need to, you know, find some you know, pipeline component that you could reuse them so you don't have to build the pipeline from scratch. Uh, so same thing with the pipeline component, you can also view them, download them, and test it out by execute them, right, on um, a single pipeline, a uh, single component pipeline um, um, use case. And as you can see in uh, these examples, um, you, when you want, let's say you want to test like, how, you know, this echo components, um, you know, like print out the string, you could just simply test it out by just doing execution. It will just compose that whole component into a single step pipelines. And over here, you could see how this uh, echo sample is being executed. And as you can see, um, it, it, it just as expected, this echo component is print out a statement that you have put in. And of course, um, once you have all this pipeline, right, all this workflow has been, you know, uh, created for you. And whenever you run those workflows, you probably have generated some sort of models. 
um, how you actually, you know, like put store those models and share those models. And this is also handled by machine learning exchange where you could like, uh, register your models when you, um, uh, prepackage them into either container or binary files. And machine learning exchange provide where you could deploy this model as a, you know, standalone container or serve on top of KSERF where, uh, it could have the multiple models, uh, inside a, a single container as well. And last but not least, uh, when it comes to data sets, um, it's very important for us to know where the data coming from and how we verify what licenses under this data set. So, um, that's what uh, machine learning exchange has actually the main power for where, uh, in this case, you see the CoNet data set is stored in a machine learning exchange. Uh, it has, you know, like, uh, defined what kind of license, uh, all the metadata that you need to understand, uh, where the data is coming from and how you could leverage this data, uh, under whatever policies, um, as, as you train the models. And once you have understand all those, you can also deploy the data set, which means, um, behind the scenes data streams, uh, the platform we use is actually putting the data sets and help you, you know, cache the data sets as needed. Um, so you, you don't have to, you know, uh, whenever you do, let's say distribute training, you don't have to like always pull all the same data sets, right. From, you know, the internet all the time, you could just have a cache, um, volume, on uh, on using data stream that, you know, able to reuse them in multiple, you know, training process. And of course, that's not this. I, if you also have a notebook, you know, able to leverage, uh, whatever data set, whatever models, whatever pipeline you have, you could also, you know, um, create them as an asset. Um, basically a notebook is just like a piece of code. You could, um, mount on any data set um, that we have, you know, uh, created on machine learning exchange. And then behind the scenes, the notebook is, you know, in this case, you just kind of like, um, test the data sets, process them and create a um, language classifier at the end of the notebooks. So, um, so you could leverage that with the data set uh, integration in uh, machine learning exchange. So the notebook could just take, you know, something on the internet um, and just run them. And the whole you know, integration is done by machine learning exchange. And of course, behind the scene, this, this execution of the notebook is, uh, is, um, empowered by the, um, default pipelines. And with this, I kind of just want to close up like, um, what kind of, uh, catalog machine learning exchange has, um, hosted right now. So we have, you know, a list of pipelines, components, models, notebooks, and data sets, um, that has been verified and, um, uh, with all the licensing, um, and especially when it comes to data set, um, you can see like, uh, the component data sets and all the, um, any financial and public pub tab data sets. We also have to verify them and make sure like, um, they are, you know, free to use on open source and able to, you know, leverage them without any, uh, government issues. And with this, I will go to pass back to a uh, question to show us a demo, how you could, you know, leverage the corner data set on top of version and exchange. Thank you, Tommy. Yeah. So jumping right in this, this is how the machine learning exchange looks when you open it up, it's the home screen. And as Tommy just explained, you will, you have a, a navigation menu where you can navigate through all the different asset types, um, data sets, models, and notebooks is what we're going to uh, focus on in this quick demo. And so under data sets, you, you see this uh, variety of, um, of data sets that we have. Um, and here you see project CodeNet. And since project CodeNet is a very large data set, um, we have broken it down into smaller data sets, um, that lend themselves better to particular tasks. So in the machine learning exchange, you can find, um, the data set that's trimmed down for the language classifier and another one, um, for the masked language model. Today, I want to show the, um, the language classifier and similar to the animated GIF that Tommy just showed in the, in the presentation. Um, you land on the description, which is a readme. Um, you find all the links to where you can download the data set. If you want to do your own experimentation, um, along with the license, um, some description and a lot of links, if you want to dive deeper, um, the YAML, Tommy has explained that and related assets. 
there's a notebook that you can run with this data set. And if you want to mount, uh, create the PVC for this data set, you can launch it right from um, right from here. Um, provide a namespace that you want the PVC to be mounted in and click Submit. And you will see that the uh, Q4 pipelines run graph, run graph shows up. And I think this pipeline that, that we started here has two steps. One is to generate the metadata um, using the metadata we have in MLX and generate the metadata that's required by Datashem. And then the persistent volume gets created. Um, you can follow along um, with looking at the logs tab here. Um, so in this case, I have run this just prior to the demo. So um, the data sets has, has been bounded. And uh, you can also, you know, check out the configuration, run output if there's any run output. Um, we um, will go um, and put an output here. You can see the output that's been generated, status, and the name of the um, the persistent volume in the Qflow namespace. I'm going to copy that and go to um, our notebook. Um, we have an accompany, accompanying notebook for this data set. Um, for both the data sets we have, the, we have the language classification and the masked language model. I will jump into the language classification notebook and um, take a quick look at the notebook preview. So when you upload notebooks to the machine learning exchange, um, we use the NB Viewer plugin so that you can get a preview, a rendered preview of the notebook, and you can find out more what the notebook does, what the output should be, and you can compare the um, output here that, that was there when the notebook was created with the output, you know, when you run the notebook. Um, you don't have to download the notebook though. You can also launch it right here from the machine learning exchange. Um, we're going to use that um, PVC with the cached data and we're going to mount it to a local directory in the pod and click submit. And now um, a pipeline pipeline gets launched and the notebook will be run on a Kubernetes pod. Um, we use the paper mill um, library and the um, Elira AI notebook component. And you can get similar details here. And most interestingly, you can follow along with the logs. You can see what is happening. Um, typically, notebooks, the you know, first thing we need to do is we catch all, fetch all the um, the required Python libraries. Um, and then these Python libraries have to be downloaded and installed. And that whole process might take a while. So allow me to go to a previous run um, that I did just before that demo. The run typically takes about you know, two to three minutes. And at the end of the run, um, you can see all of the logs, all of the individual cells, that, you know, the input of the cells, the code block itself, and the output. And um, in the case of notebooks, we generate an output notebook. And you can download this directly from here and um, open it up in a browser. And here you can see the notebook look, looks very similar to um, the NB preview that we had earlier. Um, and the notebook actually um, takes the data, does some pre-processing, processing, um, um, you know, creates that um, data set, a training set, and a test set, um, does the training. Uh, um, you can see it, it will go through 20 epochs of training. Um, and then at the very end, you can see um, the training and validation accuracy and the training loss. And there's a, in the last couple of cells, there is some test where our model that we trained, we give it some test data. And um, in that last run that I did a few minutes ago, you can see that out of the 100 test samples um, of the 10 languages, most of them were um, classified correctly, except one C++ sample was misclassified. Um, now, once, once we have that model trained, um, we can serve that model also with MLX. And so you can go to um, the coordinate language classification model. This is a containerized, um, containerized version of that um, that um, language classification model that we just trained. And when you look at models here, Tommy explained, you can see um, the description, which is a rendered um, GitHub style readme. Um, you have the YAML file that is required to um, upload, upload it to MLX. Um, you can find out where uh, the the actual container images. 
and some other information depending on the asset that you're looking at and you'll see the code that we use to use to run the pipeline in this case we want to serve it with kubernetes so we go straight to launch and say we want to serve this model on the kubernetes platform and um, the run name will leave as is click submit and same same as before you will see the q4 pipelines run graph come up and this time we will um we will see there's um two tasks in this pipeline one is to generate the configuration data we need and this the most important one is is the actual deployment and again you can follow uh, follow the logs if you want and you can see the um, output and the output will also tell tell you where it's been deployed and um, once it's been deployed you can um, port forwarding here you can open it in a browser um, and see it's being served on localhost 5000 and each of the containerized models we have um, the they are you know they're they're flask based um, python there's a flask based api that shows you the um, swagger generated ui and Swagger with the Swagger API UI, you can actually exercise the models endpoints. And so for each of the models in the machine learning exchange, um, you can get some metadata and you can even use it to, to make predictions. So for this model, um, you can click try it out and then provide some data. Yeah, I did that before. I looked at some Haskell samples. Um, so let's just pick one and click execute. And then you see the prediction output is that it's, um, you know, 99% sure it's Haskell. And there's a slight probability it would have been Python or Java. So depending on um, how well your model is trained, and of course, you know, the, the size of your sample and, you know, various factors, the prediction can be more or less accurate. Um, and then back back in MLX, um, you can see that uh, we, we used that data set for project codenet um we uh, ran our notebook and then we showed that we we can even serve that trained model now before i end i want to show um, two github repositories um, one is for the machine learning exchange uh, on github.com machine-learning.exchange where you can see all of the mlx source code and all of the sources for the assets in our catalog including um, the notebooks that I just showed and even the notebook source code. And the other more interesting project per perhaps is the project CodeNet um, repository. You can find that under github.com IBM slash project CodeNet. And here you should find um, everything you need to know about the data set itself, um, about the research papers, um, benchmarks, um, you know, the tools that you can use um, to process the data. And you should also be able to find um, the, the notebooks that I should just showed you with that um i want to end our presentation and say thank you um tommy i hope i didn't miss anything yeah thank you very much thank you very much uh, thank you very much and see you at the next conference